to thank you all for well joining us. We are on Joshua chapter two. Um, last week we did something different, so now we are back to Joshua. Do encourage you. I sent out the the little message earlier. Do encourage you to spend time reading the book of Joshua. Uh, it's it's an easy listen, um, and for lack of a better term, this is my own term. Okay, I'm just making this up. I was thinking of thinking of it this way today. Joshua is not a book that is theologically dense. That doesn't mean it's not important. It, it, it most certainly is. It's very important, but it's not theologically dense. There's not a lot of real heavy stuff that you have to kind of pound through verse by verse. That makes it easier to listen to. The book of Acts is the same way. All kinds of really good, very important stuff. It's not theologically dense. It is an action novel. This is an action novel. It's the action novel of the conquest. And it is very important because it is the account of how God granted his children what he had promised to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. And we're with that, we're going back approximately 470 years. And the, well, actually, the 470 years just goes back to when they went into slavery. Abram, several hundred years before that. So the fulfillment of those promises, and we'll see some things today, if I quit yakking and we get to it, where those very promises are brought to mind. But it is so important because God keeps his word. He is here keeping his word 40 years later than he wanted to keep his word. Not his fault that they had to wait 40 years. It was because of the rebellion of his children. And don't forget that as we listen to this. They chickened out. They saw these people in the land, and 10 of the 12 spies said, we can't take them. They'll destroy us. We're like grasshoppers compared to them. And, and just a quick note, there's a lot of stuff out there about the size of the giants in, in the Old Testament. And I think that it probably errs, much of the information errs on the huge, huge, huge side and a lot of it airs on, you know, ah, they were like NBA size players or, you know, six foot six, seven foot. Uh, they were scary. They were huge. And yes, people of that day were not as tall. We know that. But the giants were still giants. They were massive. And they were scared to go in and they chickened out. And what they did when they let, and, and think of that this way. When they let fear grab hold of their hearts, what they did was decide that God's a liar. That's what fear does to you. Fear convinces you that God's a liar, or he's a well-intentioned, doddering old man who's just not up to the drill. He can't keep his promises. It's what it does. Faith lays hold of the promises of God, and then having laid hold of the promises of God, advances in the assurances those promises give. If God be for me, who can be against me? That's Paul's conclusion. If God's for me, who can be against me? Nothing can undo me. It's all in God's hands. And did Paul eventually get undone? Yeah, he got his head lopped off. Horrible, horrible thing. But that served God's purposes, and it was fine with Paul. Paul had many escapes along the way. Faith lays hold of the promises of God. Fear calls God a liar. Good way to think of it. The children of Israel, led by Joshua, who was a seriously bad dude. Joshua was a warrior. Joshua was a man's man. No doubt. And I'm not saying Moses wasn't. He certainly was. Tells us he was still vigorous at 120 years old. His eye hadn't dimmed and his strength hadn't waned. Joshua is just a bad dude. He just is. And, and he's the one that the Lord chose 
and lead the children into the conquest, the laying hold of his promises. And it's not because Joshua is a really tough dude and that the Israelites are just awesome warriors. They're not. They were rabble. They were just out there wandering in the wilderness. You, you notice nowhere in the Pentateuch does it tell us that Moses had them doing military drills, form a phalanx, advance, charge, bring in the cavalry. N none of that. None of that. It's not by their might and it's not by their power. It's by God's power. I'll quit yakking and we'll start reading. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. Shittim is just a place with a bunch of trees. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, the men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman who had taken the two men and hidden them, but the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Very, very interesting stuff. Number one, let's just, yeah, Rahab was a prostitute. Rahab was a prostitute. Same word is used for innkeeper sometimes, but Rahab was a prostitute. It refers to it many times. She was what she was. God uses us. And guess what? We're all broken. We've all got problems. We've all fall, sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Rahab was a prostitute, but, but she was a believer. And we're going to see that very clearly in what she says. Rahab had come to believe in Yahweh, and God used her. And not only did God use her, God's going to use her. She is, and I, I, I'm thinking like the great-great-grandmother of David. She is in the lineage of Christ, Rahab the harlot, and it even refers to her that way, Rahab the harlot. God redeems things. He redeems us, and, and that means he, he buys it back, he cleans it up, and he says, I've got a place for you. You know, we are living stones in his church, and, and, and Rahab is a very important stone, and she's a faithful woman. She's a courageous woman, and she's an honest woman. She sees what she sees, and she knows what it means. Let's talk about it. The king of Jericho is told that, the spot, that these men had come in to search out the land. We're going to get the picture, and if you listen to Head, like I advise that you do, and, and for everybody out there, you know, this is uh, our Sunday morning Bible thing for many of us, but for you out there listening, I strongly advise, if you want to follow along in this study of the book of Joshua, which I wholeheartedly encourage you to do, listen to the whole book. And like I said, it's easy, it's an easy read, it's easy to listen to. Listen to the whole book, and then maybe start and listen to it again. We're not as familiar with a lot of the book of Joshua, but it's it's important to get the whole the whole big picture. But the picture that's going to be painted in these next in this chapter and the one that follows, the whole land, the promised land of the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Girgashites, the Canaanites, they were quaking in their boots. They were quaking in their boots. We'll talk about that more later. But if you're afraid of this massive invasion, 
and the fear of God literally has been put in you, guess what you become really quickly? Paranoid, suspicious. You know, even, even paranoid people have enemies, right? You become suspicious. Two strangers come in. They look different. They're probably dressed different. Everybody was on the lookout. They were expecting something. So they knew these guys had come in, and they suspected that they were Hebrews, okay? And where did they go? If you go into town, you go into an inn. Well, inn, and, and this isn't, you know, this isn't middle America wholesome suburbs, right? This, that, that wasn't the world as it existed. The difference between the Motel 6 and a brothel didn't exist. They're, they were pretty much the same thing, okay? So they came into town. Where did they go? They went into the inn. Now, it doesn't say, and the language is clear, they went into her house, it says. It doesn't say they went into her. That's the ter- that would be the turn of phrase. The euphemistically say they went in and slept with her. It doesn't say that. But they did go in, and and you could go to one of those places like a Super 8 or a Motel 6 and and get a room. And that's where they went. She took them, and she hid them. And I just got a, let's see, where did that picture go? I thought I had that popped up. Anyway, the roof oftentimes had a roof over it. It's the second story. Okay, and it's where they would keep food for animals and food for themselves, etc. So there was a bunch of flax up there, and she was able to hide them underneath. And she, of her own free will and volition, sends the troops out to go look for them. She says, Yeah, they were here, and she makes it sound like they came in to do business. They were here, man, and they left. So the men pursued after them all the way to the Jordan. They went out, you know, picture a posse in the Old West. They go riding out, chasing after these guys, um, and the gate is shut. That's more information as to the frame of mind. First of all, at night, they shut the gate anyway. At night in the city, they shut the gate. Didn't matter who you were, you didn't get in because they could get tricked and the gate would be open and in would come invaders or marauders, whatever. But it makes the point of saying the gate was shut. They were on high alert. They were very uptight and nervous. Verse 8. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord... See that? See that? Lord, Yahweh. She calls him Yahweh. I know that Yahweh... Because the three small capital letters, that means it's Yahweh. And again, just make clear why I'm starting to try to remember. Got a whole lot of years of habit to break. Even in Jesus' day, they called him Yahweh. It was after that time. The transition was starting to happen. They didn't switch to not mentioning the name of the Lord until way, definitely way after this, okay? That, that was Jewish pietism, and it, had, it takes away. When you see that name, you should, you should read it as Yahweh, because Yahweh is, I am who I am. I am he who causes to be. She said, I know that he who causes to be has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is the God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. 
And the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Very clear in, in what we just read here. Very clear, this woman's faith. <laughs> but she says, the fear of you has fallen upon us. Fear. Have you ever really been afraid? Think, think of the time when you've really been afraid. Something rocked your world, and you were afraid. Not, I mean, there's the devastated that comes from something awful that happens, but fear. Fear, of, fear is in anticipation, right? Uh, imagine that fear a thousandfold, because this is fear that God was putting on them. If God wants to make people afraid, they're going to be afraid. Listen to what it says in Exodus 15. Exodus 15, what was that talking about? They had just crossed the Red Sea. In Exodus 15, in the Song of Moses, it says, terror and dread fall upon them, looking forward to the people where they were going in the promised land. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone till your people, O Lord, O Yahweh, pass by, till the people pass by whom you have purchased, right? He redeemed them. He bought them back out of slavery and set them free. But fear and dread was going to fall upon them. And then in Exodus 23, 27, we talked about this back when we went through Exodus, and you can go and listen. There's a whole playlist of videos on the book of Exodus. At this point, we're up through like chapter eight on that, on the, on the playlist. I will send my terror before you, and I will throw into confusion all the people against whom you shall come, and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. Hand-to-hand -hand combat, because that's the way everything was done, and your enemies turn their back to you. I'm handing them to you. I'm lining them up like bowling pins, so, and I'm putting the bumpers up <laughs> so you can knock them down, and they're terrified of you. So God sends his terror, and Rahab is talking about that. And how does Rahab respond? Unlike the other people, what does Rahab do? She believes. She believes. She sees who this God is and that he is the true God of gods, and we'll talk about that. For we have heard how Yahweh dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. We're going to get real soon to him crossing, crossing the Jordan. How did they do that? You think that was insignificant? I don't think so. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon Og, whom you devoted to destruction. Sihon Og, you know who they were? Well, they were giants. And this is before the conquest, while Moses was still around, and we didn't go through this part in the in, in the in, in the Pentateuch. While while they were still around, while Moses was still around, they took out Sihon and Og. Sihon and Og were giants. They were seriously, seriously bad dudes. So in comparison, a historical reference, and it's something that to many modern Western people, we don't get this. When Hitler in 1939 went and wiped out Poland in one month, he did it in a month. We think, oh, the Polish army. No, no, no. The Polish army was the biggest army in Europe. Now, they hadn't modernized, but people didn't appreciate the importance of that yet. It was a massive, huge army, and he undid them in a month. And then, guess what he did? He went and did the same thing to the French. You know what the second biggest army in all of Europe was? The French. So we look at it, well, yeah, the French. What do the French do? They cook and they surrender, right? That's, that's And I'm sorry to any French people out there. I'm, that's the way Americans think about it, okay? Fair or unfair. 
nobody thought of them that way then. They'd won World War I along with the British and the Americans and the Russians. They, they had a huge, huge, huge army, all kinds of problems with it, but boom, they were gone. Same thing here with Sehan Og, except Sehan Og, they didn't have huge militaries that had failed to, to modernize. They were tough guys, tough kingdoms, and they'd taken them out and devoted to destruction. That term is important. Devoted to destruction is what they're going to do to Jericho. That means everybody dies. Everybody dies. Animals, people, children, old people, possessions, everything goes. We'll talk about why. Now, when I say that, and especially when I talk about children, whatever else, our response to that is, that's terrible. Yeah, it is. It is. God's judgment is terrible. It's terrible. It is that the last day is terrible. But you know what? I don't know the statistics. I've, I've heard it before. Do you know how many people die every day? Do you know how many of them aren't believers? That's terrible. Some of them are believers. That's great. That's great. But, but we don't want to soft sell or, or make excuses for God's judgment. God judges when he judges, and, it, and it's not my place to question it. Because I'm just little bitty me, and I don't know much. And I'm a wretch. Humility of faith. Humility of faith. It's not my place to tell him that's terrible. You shouldn't do that. But you will hear that a lot about the book of that Genesis. Uh, sorry. The book of Joshua specifically. Oh, what kind of God is it goes in and kills all those people? He's a good and righteous God. And you rebel against him. You live in rebellion against him. He decides when the clock stops ticking for you. And that should put fear in your heart. It's intended to, but it is also just righteous and just because sin deserves hell. Let's not soft sell it. Sin deserves hell. And no one knows that better than Jesus Christ, who went to the cross and suffered the hell that we deserve. It's a terrible thing. It's a great thing. Always that dual nature of things that we need to keep in mind as we're sorting through and trying to understand. And it's okay to question and wonder. It's called thinking, and thinking is a good thing. I want to think about these things. I want to do what I can to understand it. And when I struggle, I want to pursue the truth on it and come to an understanding. It's interesting. 1 Timothy 2.4 says that God desires that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Truth. We want truth. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. But God desires salvation. God doesn't want to condemn anyone. He puts up with all the chaos and nonsense and rebellion and sin and all the yuck of this world because he's still got souls to save, and he's willing to put up with the stench of this foul world in order to do it. That's the way we need to think. Because when we think that God's unjust, what we always do is we turn it upside down. We turn it upside down and we make him the blame for it. Sounds like Satan's doing, doesn't it? Blame God for my sin. We don't want to go there. Back to Rahab. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you, for the Lord your God, listen to this, for the Yahweh, or Yahweh, your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. This is a person born and raised in a pantheistic society, all kinds of deities that they worshiped, all kinds of gods that they worshiped, and those gods were real. They were the B'nai Elohim, the sons of God. Oh, God, that term right there, God, and you see down, way down the bottom left, if you look really closely, it's Elohim. Elohim simply means spiritual being, but he's the God 
of the spiritual beings, God of the heavenly host. Much of that heavenly host, not much, but a lot of it, rebelled against him, and the other nations worshiped them. But she understands the Lord your God, Yahweh, your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. He's the real deal. They all answer to him. What happened in Egypt shows that they all answered in him because nobody here now in this time, even the people in Jericho, they would not have thought that their gods were as mighty as the gods of Egypt. Why? Well, look at Egypt. How are they faring? Their gods must be the mightiest gods. There's a reason. There's a reason that God sent his children, Jacob, down into slavery there because he was setting up the biggest bully on the block to smack him around, kick his tail, leave him literally buried in Sheol in those waters of the Red Sea because that's what they thought the Red Sea, the, the water was. That's where Sheol, the underworld, was. And then come here to the promised land, and Rahab had the sense to recognize him for who she was. By faith, she understood that that's who she was. You know who's mentioned in Hebrews 11? If you're ever feeling down, if you're ever feeling down, I don't know about you, I, I feel down so many times. Why? Because I'm weak. I'm a sinner. I spend all day teaching the Word of God. You'd think I wouldn't get it wrong, <laughs> that, that I wouldn't get down and lost. Wrong. Go read Hebrews 11. About by faith, by faith, by faith. And in Hebrews 11.31, guess who's mentioned? In that list of the heroes of faith of the Old Testament who were willing to suffer all kinds of things and endure all kinds of hardship, guess who's listed? Well, let's go look. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. She's the last one mentioned by name in that big long list of by faith, by faith, by faith. She's the last one mentioned by name because from there he goes on to talk in, in, well, no, no, I guess there are still more names. Sorry, forget that part. But she's one of the few mentioned by name. Many are just alluded to by by what they did. So Rahab's an interesting person, an interesting character. Okay. Deuteronomy 4.39, know therefore today and lay it to your heart that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath, there is no other. And when it says there is no other, saying he's the biggest one on the block. Nobody else compares. He's the, he's the only ruler in heaven above. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord. This is the language of a believer. And she believed because what she'd seen. So she wants her family saved. Do you know what the thing is? It, it, and as, as you get older, as you get older, and, and I'm, I'm making that journey, right? We all do. We all do. Well, not all of us. The Lord might call us home before that, and that's a blessing. <laughs> but, but, but as you get older, you know what you care about? And, and many of you out there, I'm not having to tell you. I'm not having to tell the grandparents and, and, and the parents out there. The faith of my family, their salvation, their well-being, I, I'd trade anything for it. I'd give up my life for it. I'd, I'd give up all I have for it, the most important thing. When God, you know, this is important truth. When God gives you kids, he's given you those kids to raise for him. That's your job. That's your job. I'm entrusting them to you. Raise them for me. Don't let them decide crazy things like it goes on today. I'm not going to go down that tangent for themselves. Train them up in the way they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. That's what, that's what really matters. And Rahab, in faith, was she concerned about? The safety of her family, the salvation of her family. And do you think 
that you could see her example of faith, if you're part of her extended family, and not have that impact you and change your heart? I don't think so. Then she let him down by a rope. That's a gutsy move. That's a gutsy move. What if she was seen? What if somebody was looking out their window and her house was in the wall of the city? That's the way it worked then. Um, the, ha- the wall was there and people would build their houses in the wall. It helped reinforce the wall, etc. But she let him down by a rope through the window. Her house was built into the city wall so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, go into the hills. And I, I think I already read this part, right? Tie the scarlet cord. So she sends them out going the wrong way. And they say, we'll do this. We'll do this. She sent them away. They departed. She tied a scarlet cord in the window. They departed and went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned. And the pursuers searched all along the way and found nothing. They made their deal. We'll get back to that in a few chapters. Then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and they told him all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, this is the big takeaway. They got sent there as spies. Listen to what their report is to see what it was they were spying. Truly, the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. Do you think Joshua, that man of faith, who back 40 years ago said, we can take them. God's given them to us. He'll grant us success. Do you think he wanted a count of armed troops, what kind of weapons they had, that kind of stuff? And that's not what is reported, is it? No, he didn't want that. They wanted to just get a feel for the hearts of the people Truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. Maybe you can think of some kind of athletic contest that you were in at some point in time, and and you looked across the way, and the person you were matched up with looked scared. What'd you know? What did you know? Easy day. Easy night. I won. I won. I won. (laughs) His knees are shaking. His knees are shaking. I think I'm good. I think I think this could be a night to pad my statistics. You know, th- th- that's what they saw. That's what they saw, and it emboldened them because it wasn't about them. These spies knew that these people were not afraid of them as a people. Everything Rahab said was about whom? Yahweh, what he did, that he is the God of gods, etc. So... Just as far as um, management of the people, ruling of the people goes. The Lord did this to reassure the children of Israel. Because why? They balked the last time. They got right here before. They were right strategically in the same place, and they turn around and ran away. So he gives them a little something to reassure them. You know why? Because God knows that we're frail. He knows that we're dust. He understands that. He has patience with us, and that's a good thing. He's being patient with the children of Israel. Israel crosses the Jordan. Wow, we did a whole chapter. We're going into a second chapter. We're just fairly sailing along. If you've been listening for a while, you know why that's funny. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they sat out from Shittim, and they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. Again, just remind yourself the logistical effort it took for them to move. How many people there were moving that camp all the animals, all the tents, 
all of that stuff every time they moved, every time they moved. And they had to be thinking, all of this is soon going to be over. I'm going to have a house. I'm going to have a place that's mine. When you've wandered, these people, how long have they wandered? All their lives. All their lives. Maybe some of them remembered Egypt, the ones who were like 18, 17, 15, 10, when, when things happened back when they left Egypt. Most of these people, all they knew was wandering in the wilderness. And if you'd been wandering in the wilderness since you were 12 and now you were 52, would you describe that as all your life? All my life, it's all I've known. And it's almost over. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits. I bet you that little number tells us how far it was. Yeah, 3,000 feet in length. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go for you have not passed this way before. More just practical stuff. They haven't been here before. The ark is going to go before you with the Levitical priest carrying it. If you stay back 3,000 feet, a mile is 5,280 feet, so a little more than half a mile. If you stay back that far, you can see where it's going because, again, it's like steering an aircraft carrier or a super tanker. If a super tanker wants to turn, how far in advance does the guy have to start to turn that wheel? A really long way. So it was just common sense logistics. <clears throat> Pardon me. But there is something else to it. What's the something else? The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. The Ark, it was that box that sat at the feet of a deity. In most countries, it was an idol that was there. And the, the agreement between the people and that God was placed in that box. It was the footstool of God, right? That is what's leading you in. It's significant. It's, it, it, it's, it itself is conveying a message. The Lord's leading you in. The Lord's leading you, and you don't need to guard the ark because God's got it. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, Take up the ark of the covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the ark of the covenant and went before the people. And thanks to technology, here's a picture of guys carrying the ark. And this back here, that's the water that's going to pile up. It's just an artist's rendition. And I looked at this, and I'm sorry. I, the, the, the priests, they're decked out pretty nicely, but look at the hair. He looks like Kevin Cronin, the lead singer from REO Speedwagon. He really does. Skinny little guy. But th these are the priests. And I'm sorry. That's just the way my sense of humor works. Um, but they're, they're carrying it across the Jordan River. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Yahweh said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you. Being exalted is a tricky thing, especially in, the, in any context in any setting, but especially in the context of the faith. If God, God is here, let's just talk about this. God is here exalting Joshua. He's making Joshua look good. He's giving glory to Joshua. What's Joshua's job? Reflect that glory on God. Joshua being exalted served Yahweh's purpose, because he needed a strong leader. He needed the people to respect Joshua the way Josh, the way the people had respected 
Moses, and he had made promises, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you all the days of your life. No one will be able to stand against you. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. One of my favorite passages, but it's just words. To the people of Israel, that was really cool. That assurance was really neat. It was just words. Moses had done some amazing things. God did amazing things through Moses. But that mantle, in effect, it hasn't been, it's been passed ceremonially, if you will, but in action, they haven't seen it yet. That's what's going to happen. As for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, Come here and listen to the words of Yahweh, your God. And Joshua said, here is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man, and when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, Yahweh of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. We're going to be told this was the flood time, that this was... When the water, when the water was high, so it wasn't just like a dried up stream, a few feet deep that they were going through. The Jordan could get pretty deep and pretty wide at the right time of year, and it was the time of year <laughs> that they were going to be that they were going to be passing through. Joshua announces in advance what's going to happen. If it doesn't happen, how does he look? So he, he Joshua is in that <clears throat> acting in faith. But verse 10, and Joshua said, here is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out. And then this list, okay? This list is, is very interesting, very interesting. This is the same list that was promised. Let's go back and look at Genesis 15, 19 to 21. Genesis 15, we're way back there. We're with Abraham early on. We're with Abraham right after God told him, look up at the stars of the sky. And if you could number them, so will your descendants be. And to you and your offspring, I will give this land, the land of the Kenites, the Kenites, the Ketamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Sound familiar? It's interesting, and, and this is from the Faith Life Study Bible. There are people in these scholars, these go and count and look at all these things. 24 lists like this in the Old Testament. 24 lists. There are always seven, seven nations listed out, and these are the nations that God was giving over, okay? There is some rotation through, but it's always seven. Seven, it, it wasn't Seven is one of the big numbers, right? What are the big numbers? Ten's a big number, 12's a big number, 40's a big number, and seven is a big number. Seven. Seven is the number of the covenant. Seven is the number of the covenant, and as we work on through the scriptures, we see that four is the number of the earth, four winds, four directions, four points of the compass, however you want to look at it. Three is the number of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Three is the number of God. Holy, holy, holy in Isaiah is the Lord God Almighty. So you got, you got seven nations that would be listed off, but there's a little bit of variation as you work through these 24 times. Several of them are always in there, like the Canaanites, et cetera, the Hittites. And, and you notice in that list in, in Genesis 15, you got the Rephaim in there. This is giant talk. This is giant talk, as with the Amorites as well and the Jebusites. We'll go into that more 
on, on a different day. But interestingly, with the variation of the seven nations that would be listed off in these 24 different settings, the total number of nations included, you know, kind of rotate one in, rotate one out, is 12. 12. 12 nations, like 12 tribes. 12 tribes of the one nation that God made for his own when he picked Abram from Ur of the Chaldeans and said, out of you, in Genesis 15, out of you, I will make a great nation. He said it first in Genesis 12. But interesting. There, there's, there's more to it here than just rattling off, rattling off the nations, although that in its own is impressive. And as they get ready to go face these nations where there be giants, right? And it's like Pirates of the Caribbean out beyond that point on the map, there be monsters, you know. Well, they're giants, and giants were real. And, and, and everybody knew at this time, even in the time of Jesus, everybody knew who the giants were. Everybody had the same understanding of who the giants were. And, and it was because of St. Augustine, mm, a couple hundred years later, that this understanding of the giants being what they were, the hybrids between spiritual beings, the B'nai Elohim, and men, that that, that fell out of favor in the church because St. Augustine was such a big player. And I'm not putting St. Augustine down, an amazing theologian and, and, and faithful man and a saint. But I, I'm going through all this for a reason. They were giants, and they weren't just big. They weren't just big. They were hybrids between gods and men. And interestingly, what do you have in Greece? You got those hybrids, right? Other cultures, you've got those hybrids. Everybody knew about this stuff. Everybody, everybody understood it. It's one thing to face a really big dude. It's another thing to face a really big dude whose great-grandpa is a god. Scary stuff. Scary stuff. But we have to remind ourselves of all this stuff because we don't have their worldview. That's not what's programmed in our head. Just like something in our own time that I just corrected for many people possibly a little bit ago, thinking that the Poles and the French were a bunch of doofuses who it was easy for the Germans to take out. The world shook when Hitler took them down and as fast as he did it. That Blitzkrieg stuff, it was entirely new. Now MacArthur understood it and Patton understood it, but it was to the rest of the world, they hadn't caught up. They didn't know what lightning war and, and mixed force rapid advance was like. But even in our time, we get a misunderstanding of what that signified and who those people were who were taken down. So thousands of years later, this idea that these people were giants and hybrids of gods and men, we, we have to do some work and remind ourselves of that stuff because the scriptures obviously revisit it all the time. And they're going to be wiped out. A big part of the wiping everybody out, all the places all the places that God sent his children to conquer, not all of them were all wiped out. Those are the ones we remember because it's, it, it, it offends our modern sensibilities. But that's where the giants were. That's where those bloodlines were. That's why they were wiped out, because they were all infected with it, and it could come back. And the last of them got wiped out by whom? Because they didn't complete the conquest the way they were supposed to. Spoiler alert, they didn't complete the conquest the way they were supposed to. They didn't. They came up short. And Goliath and his brothers and others were still there. Who wiped them out? The, the, the prototypical Savior, the one who more than anyone foreshadowed Christ, David wiped them out. 
So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, just imagine this pageantry. And as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the brink of the water, just the edge, this was the high water mark time. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood up and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan, and those flowing down toward the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off, and the people passed over opposite Jericho. Many want to say that this is fanciful Sunday school nonsense. You know, it was on the on the wall on the for those of us who are older, it was on the wall on the the felt pictograms. Remember, that was technology in Sunday school when we were kids. And the teacher would let you take the little felt thing of Joshua and stick it up on the wall, and it would stay there, right? And the ark and whatever else. It's Sunday school nonsense, right? That's, that's what Satan wants us to think. It wants to take these mighty works of God and make them less or make them imagination that these were stories that were written to make the, you know, thousands, hundreds of years later, the Israelites wrote these stories to make themselves look good. Nonsense. It is what happened. We don't want to take the miracles of God who can do anything he wants and make them small. And this miracle served a very important purpose. You know, we can ponder, is this a, a miracle as big as parting the Red Sea? That's probably not, right? This is a river. The Red Sea is a, well, a sea. Um, but there is the component with this that that water had to keep stacking up because it was flowing down, and God wanted it to stack up. Do you think everybody was looking at that as they walked by? You know, it's like the 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 kid's Bible that we had when my children were small of passing through the Red Sea, and the one kid, if, if you study the picture while you're reading the Look, the kids are looking at the picture, and one little kid sticking his finger in the water, and a fish is looking out at him. You know, we try to imagine what that looked like. Well, that water was piling up, and the river heading on down for the Dead Sea dried up, and there they were passing through. It's more than just something cool. God could have done all kinds of things to impress and to wow. This specifically says. I'm the God who parted the Red Sea. Do you remember that? I've had you the whole time. I've fed you miraculously with manna and quail and provided water out of a rock when necessary. All of that is coming to mind for them as they pass through. Many of them hadn't passed through the Red Sea because they hadn't been born yet. But they knew the story. You think they're parents and told them about it, and their uncles and their grandpas and everybody else. Yeah. So it was a reminder to them how fast, now nobody was tweeting it, nobody did a video and had it go viral, but how fast do you think the news of this spread to Jericho and beyond? They'd heard the stories about what God had done to the Egyptians in the Red Sea. And now, right here, the Jordan River, right here, parted, stacked up in a heap, and they walked through. How about that God putting his fear upon them? Yeah, I think so. This this miracle served a very important purpose. So now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. Now, guys, some of you guys out there um, who are part of our little group here, um, not on BitChute or YouTube audience out there, some of you guys have have helped me move in the not-too-distant past, right? And, And you're holding something, and you're how much do you think this box weighed? I'm sorry, I just go to practical things like this. How much do you think a box of 
of wood, acacia wood, covered with gold, with solid gold eagle cherubim on top of it. Gold is ridiculous heavy. What are the poles made of? Gold. All of this stuff is gold. So my point is this. This artist's rendition is really cool. They get the the cool clothes that they were wearing. Right? I don't think there were four skinny guys holding this box. I think they picked the four biggest, buffest Levites they could find, and they carried the box because they had to. How long does it take for two and a half million people, or whatever the number is, to pass walking through the Jordan River in order by their tribes and clans? These guys were seriously strong, strong. Guys, probably took some divine intervention for him to be able to stand there and hold that thing that long, right? Now, it may seem like I'm being, you know, kind of silly and frivolous talking about this kind of stuff. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. And it's certainly not making light of it. It's honoring what God did and what he was doing and what this was about. But when the, the reason I do this stuff And it's just the way my brain works. I can't help it. I learned it from my father more than anything. But the reason I do it is this. It makes it real. I'm thinking about the activity. I'm thinking about seeing this happen. I'm thinking about, even if I wasn't the old man that I am now, and I was who I was when I was 18 years old, if I'm one of those four guys holding that box on my shoulder, that's a tough day, <laughs> right? But it puts me there. It helps me It helps me think about it. So don't think when you're reading or listening to God's Word, you hit pause on U, U version Bible, and, and you're noodling on something, and maybe some of these kind of thoughts go through your mind. You know, Satan wants to tell you, oh, you're making light of the Word of God, you know, because I mean, he'll attack you any way he can, right? And that's nonsense. I'm, I'm not thinking anything blasphemous or that that would dishonor God. I'm just thinking about what it was like to be there and what it meant for those people, what it did for the faith of those four Levites who were standing there. And if God decided to not hold that water back, who was seriously going to be in trouble? They were. Do you think that was a faith-expanding experience for them? I think so. I think so. So next time, we will pick up with them going on through, and as it says here, the, the 12 memorial stones. want to thank you all for listening. Really appreciate you tuning in. I hope that it's a blessing to you. We've got other playlists out there. Currently, as the time of this recording, we've got this on Joshua. We've got the book of Exodus. We've got Matthew, and we've got revelation. It's a great way to spend some time in the Word, encourage you to subscribe, like, share, and share it with your friends. If you find it to be a blessing, let it be a blessing to somebody else. God bless, and have a great day. That concludes our broadcast for today. We publish our videos on YouTube, BitChute, and Brideon. We hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please give us a like or a thumbs up. We invite you to subscribe so you can continue to receive our content. Also, please consider sharing this video with others. We love to hear from you, so please leave a comment below. This is Matthias76, and together we will continue to decode the deception.